the mystery that's we've, the answer we've all been waiting for for 50 years. And Barry Broman has very bravely uh, offered to do it. In case any of you don't know who Barry Broman is, I'll introduce him. He was a member of the FCCT in 1962, uh, although he doesn't look old enough. Uh, he's a very young 95. Um, no, he's not. Um, he's, um, he was in the club then. He, he was a uh, photographer with the Associated Press. Um, he's a graduate of the University of Washington in political sci science and Southeast Asian studies. Um, as I said, he came to Asia first in 62 as an Associated Press photographer and then went on to an extremely interesting career in Cambodia and South Vietnam uh, as an infantry officer in the Marine Corps uh, during the Vietnam War. He was the liaison officer in Bangkok um, and he went on to a 26 year, after, his, after the military, a 26 year diplomatic career with postings in Cambodia, Thailand, Indonesia, France, and Myanmar. He retired in 1996 uh, and returned to his first love, which loves, which are writing and photography. Uh, he's written and or photographed more than a dozen books on Asian themes, including Old Homes of Bangkok and Spiritual Abodes of Thailand, which he did with William Warren, who, who died um, uh, in the last month. He's produced 10 documentary films, including Burma, A Human Tragedy. Uh, and this is the second time in all that period that he's come to the FCCT to present a film. So what we're going to do, it's, it runs for 46 minutes, but Barry is now going to give you a quick uh, introduction uh, and tell you who is in the club with him to talk to you afterwards. Barry, can I ask you to come up? Good evening. It's good to be back in Bangkok and good to be back in the FCCT. I was a, an associate member here from 75 to 80 when I was posted to the U.S. Embassy after Cambodia fell in 75. I retired from government service, as Dominic said, in <clears throat> 96, and uh, then I started to work harder than I ever worked, doing films, doing books, a lot of magazine stories. And uh, along the way, I produced four films for the Jim Thompson Foundation, one on textiles in Nagaland, one on silk weaving in Isan, one on Jim's house, and one 11 years ago, it would have been for the, the centennial of Jim's birth. He was born 1906. We were hired to make the film for the foundation. It's never been released. It's basically an archival thing, and when we agreed to do the film, we were told very clearly, don't talk about the disappearance of Jim Thompson. It's not the, 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 the film was about Jim and his company. So I did the interviews for the film around the world, and the last question for every interview was, what do you think happened to Jim? And of course, there was a wide, uh, a wide selection of silly answers and a couple that were possible, but none of them got it right, I think, because I think we have it right, and you're going to see the film in a couple of minutes. About four years ago, a friend of mine, an old friend of mine who's here tonight, Suicha Hiranpuruk, called me up. I'm in Seattle, Washington. Suicha Noi is here in Bangkok, and he said, I think I solved the mystery of Jim Thompson. Well, okay, that's serious. And so I said, okay, what is it? He said, you gotta meet my, my friend, Teo Pin. Teo Pin is with us tonight. And uh, I met him, he told me, deathbed confession from his uncle. Ooh, this is interesting. But I need another source, I'm old AP, have to have two sources. So Noy kept working. About six months ago, he calls me again. I have another source. Willis Bird Jr. Billy's with us tonight from Chiang Mai. Billy's father, Willis Bird Sr., was uh, an OSS colonel, served with uh, Jim Thompson. Jim Thompson was OSS, Office of Strategic Services, otherwise known as OSO Social. 
the wartime sabotage intelligence unit of the United States government later morphed into CIA. So Billy had a separate angle on what happened to Jim, but together with what Tao Pin said, it came together. So I contacted my partner in Paris from Adventure, Adventure Film Productions. Okay, we made the film. We made the film actually in a hurry. Um, it runs 43 minutes. After the film, we will all be up here for our questions and answers. So please hold your questions until then. And now we'll show the film. Thank you.
and we have saved our man. But first, to understand Jim Thompson's strange face, we must go back to that crucial moment when he disappeared. The moment when he left the moonlight cottage. Possibly a man on vacation headed for his afternoon cup of tea. We need to reassemble the world in Thailand as Jim Thompson found it at the end of the Second World War. And, at the same time, we need to take a deep look into him. Why and how he arrived there? Who he really was? And importantly, wanted to be. During the war, he had been an officer in the OSS, the forerunner of the CIA, and was sent to Europe to work with the Partisan. He fought behind the lines in North Africa and France, and was a well decorated intelligence officer who helped prepare for the Allied invasion into southern Europe. Thompson had just turned 40 when he arrived in Bangkok a few days after the Japanese surrender. He was one of the first Americans to set foot in liberated Thailand. In those days, the city was still called the Venice of the East, crisscrossed by canals clogged with craft and vendors, a chaotic city full of charm and intrigue. Bangkok was still full of armed men, but they were no longer hostile. The emperor had spoken, and the Japanese accepted defeat. The war was over. Jim Thompson immediately fell in love with the country and its people. He felt at home there, at ease in high culture. A man who had found his place in the world. And in his letters to his family, he made it clear that he intended to stay. His future was in Thailand. At first, Jim tried the hotel business, joining with a friend to buy the Oriental Hotel, which was then a long way from its current five-star glamour. But they soon clashed, and Thompson withdrew from the venture. From the moment he arrived in Thailand, he began buying handwritten silk. It became a passion, which was soon the focus of his new life. He took his collection back to the U.S. to see if there was a market for it there. In New York, he talked to people in the fashion industry, and they confirmed his intuition. Western women could be easily persuaded to wear the shimmering and colorful fabric from Siam. And when the Rogers and Hammerstein musical The King and I opened on Broadway, there, shining in the limelight, was Jim Thompson's self. Royal princes and princesses. Providing a touch of luxurious authenticity to all the costumes. The musical was a tremendous success, and so were the costumes. A flood of new orders arrived. Exports of time silk increased tenfold in less than two years. That was the beginning of what was to become a textile empire. Hundreds, if not thousands, of handbooms were seen to be instead for export. Thompson found new dyes and designs, and the business continued to thrive. Bright, shocking blends of reds and pinks became his iconic colors. The elephant quickly became the hallmark of Jim Thompson textile. Hollywood was high on the list of new clients. Jim Thompson silk was used extensively in the 1959 version of Ben Hur, which won 11 Academy Awards, among them one for Best Costume. All the major characters were specially woven fabric. Time silk became a much desired luxury item and was also used for curtains and wall covering. Jim Thompson gradually acquired a worldwide reputation. He had every right to be self satisfied. A man who had started from nothing and 
were made of Thailand's most prestigious import. He was often referred to as the Silk King, for more than anyone else, he single-handedly introduced Thai silk to the world, taking a traditional cottage business and transforming it into a global brand. But he was not without his enemies. He was too successful. He had over a hundred competitors in the Thai silk business, and many resented the fact that a foreigner had led the way to an international success. To make matters worse, he had openly criticized both the Thai leadership and American foreign policy in Southeast Asia, especially the participation in the Vietnam War. As a result, he had been investigated by the FBI for potential un-American activity. He had confided to old friends that many people had a good reason to murder him. But while in this China, all of it, Laos, Cambodia, and Vietnam went up in flames, its neighbor Thailand remains a country of tranquility. Still the land of smiles, deaf to the distant voices of war. Tourism flourished, and Jim Thompson also prospered. The core of the silk business was a community of weavers in the center of Bangkok. Thompson leased a plot of land on a canal opposite them and moved into a Thai style house. That one house soon expanded to fit his social needs and contain his growing art collection. Eventually, he used the pieces of six traditional Thai houses, which he refashioned into one. He flipped the wall panel so that the richly carved decoration faced inward. The central staircase was placed inside instead of being attached to the exterior of the house. The result was a spacious, stylish design which, apart from air conditioning, had all the modern conveniences while retaining its classic Thai origin. While the rest of Bangkok was modernizing rapidly, Jim Thompson created an oasis of the past in the heart of the city. A truly elegant abode in which to live and entertain. Back in 1960, Jim Thompson was staying at this The man you wanted to meet when you came to Bangkok. An invitation for dinner at this remarkable house was never received. Jim Thompson started lying alone. The rich, the powerful, the famous, the infamous, all sat at his table. Also, businessmen, arms dealers, journalists, and diplomats. Needless to say, it could have been the ideal setting for gathering intelligence, a point that did not pass unnoticed, especially after his disappearance. Among others, his guests included Robert Kennedy, Truman Capote, Ethel Merman, Lyndon Johnson, Catherine Hepburn, Benny Goodman, Malene Dietrich, Tennessee Williams, and that's just some of the more famous ones. I could go on. It's a long list. Every piece of art was chosen with care. Sculpture from all over Southeast Asia, including ancient Thai and Burmese wood carvings, and much, much more. The entire catalog was worthy of a museum, which in fact it became and remains to this day. When the house was completed in 1959, Jim Thompson assumed a new role. An ambassador of Thai culture and an expert on Oriental art. Very little of Jim Thompson's wealth came from the sales of silk. In fact, 
He didn't need the money. He was already wealthy when he arrived in the land. He insisted on sharing the profits of the business to his neighbors. Some of them soon made enough money that they no longer had to work. His company was high-owned and paid a healthy dividend year after year. For example, a weaver who had invested $25 in 1948 could have sold his share for $850 20 years later. And one of the original investors received a check for over a million dollars in the late 1980s. Work made three times back today. So this is the new part of the company. Question about it. Jim Thompson was a man of many needs. A businessman, an architect, an art collector, a patriarch, and a spy. Also a social animal, he was an undisputed postmaster of Bangkok. So, which one of these many faces of Jim Thompson led to his demise? Or was it just a bad luck? That brings us to the heart of the matter. What really happened to Jim Thompson? Over the years, a number of possibilities have surfaced. Some more likely than others. And I have followed them one by one. Half a century ago, the jungle that surrounded the Moonlight Cottage was almost impenetrable. The home of numerous Aboriginal tribes who still hunted with blue guns and poison darts. They also dug deep animal traps along the many trails. At the bottom of these pits were some kind of ships waiting to inhale an animal that fell in. Did Jim Thompson tumble into one of these pits and die a lonely and painful death? It's possible, of course. But there is no record of anyone ever having done so. I think that Jim went on his usual walk looking for wild orchids. Jim loved to collect orchids when he went into the jungle. And he had once before been lost in the jungle and rescued when he had, you know, fallen into um, a hole. So Jim, you know, he used to go there as often as he could, and I think he just got careless, and he wandered off the path, and I think that's what happened. He was wandering around, and he fell into an animal trap, which at that time were against the law. Well, 
Well, now the man who had built that cat, when he would come and find a stone dead in that hole, because, you know, they had the bamboo spikes and so forth in those holes to catch the animals, he would have, I think, completely covered it up immediately and never gone back anywhere near that spot. So knowing that the jungle in 24 hours would cover that spot. This became a very popular explanation. Perhaps because it was exotic and matched Thompson's lifestyle. He sparked and researched through the jungle in the hopes of finding a cave or just a place to begin digging. They sent all the boy scouts to the jungle nearby to look, and they, they sent all sorts of people looking. And no one ever found even a button or a buckle or a scrap of cloth. So, you know, of course, there were lots of rumors that uh, Jim had uh, been kidnapped by the communists and taken away. Well, those were all followed up and nothing. Absolutely no truth to it whatsoever. Whatever anybody says, none of them have one piece of proof of evidence. It's only evidence of what is not. Another easy explanation is that he turned off the main road and became lost in the jungle. Very simple, very believable, and in the Cameron Highlands at that time, very possible. Although the trails were carefully marked, hunters were cautious to keep to the main ones and take a signal smoke bomb with them just in case. On the morning of the day that Jim Thompson disappeared, at breakfast, the owner of the Moonlight College announced he had found a new trail through the jungle down to the golf course and the hotel. Did Thompson take the same trail in the afternoon? Does it make sense for an overweight 61 year old man to take a second long, arduous hunt through the jungle on the same day? A woman who was close to Jim Thompson at the time, was not surprised that he chose that moment to vanish deliberately, to slip into the dense foliage and let yet another page in his life pass by. Perhaps he went on to start a new life somewhere else in the world. I think now, maybe he disappeared himself. The weekend before he disappeared, I was sitting in the window at the shop, no question, that point. And he came over to me and said, you know, and I'm going up to the range for Easter, and when I come back, I have to have this operation. As well as I knew Jim, that was out of character to come and sit and talk about an operation. And I've often wondered if he was trying to tell me that he wasn't intending to come back. So if that were true, why would he leave behind at the Moonlight Cottage items that he normally carried with him? For example, a box of pills he took for gallbladder pain and his cigarette lighter. Thompson, by the way, was a pain smoker. He also left his feet jacket on the back of his chair. Later, there were alleged sightings of Jim Thompson in Cambodia, China, and even as far as Tahiti. Another theory in the thick catalog of explanations is that Jim Thompson was the victim of a hit and run accident. But the world we are looking at today is not the world that Jim Thompson left down 50 years ago. In fact, almost impossible, especially considering it was that Easter Sunday afternoon. Then, it was a single lane, a possibly yes, great road, a stop on the two home. It then ended at Moonlight Cottage. Needless to say, there was very little trust, and the likelihood of someone speeding up or down the road was improbable. According to the theory, the driver of the car placed the body in the trunk and drove off. Jim Thompson then arrived in a shallow grave deep in the jungle, never to be found. It's possible, conceivable, even likely, he could have been 
Welcome to the Internet. During World War II, Thompson had worked for the OSS, the precursor to the CIA. That opened the door to a host of conspiracy theories. Many have been pivoting on the assumption that Jim Thompson had never stopped being a spy. The fake business was simply a bust. A convenient way to stay in touch with the guerrillas that he had known during the war. It was quite likely that at one time or another, the OSS came in contact with such revolutionary figures and posting them. Thompson knew how to survive in the jungle. While in the OSS, he had taken a course in jungle survival in Quran. He had emerged at the top of the class. Hold that into the fact that during the Malayan emergency, when the British fought a 12 year war with the Malayan communists, the Moonlight Cottage had been abandoned by its owners. The insurgents often used it as a base of operations. Horrible atrocities were committed on both sides. The communists held captives at the Moonlight Cottage. Some were assassinated in the flower beds, if not buried between the rose bushes. How many? No one knows. Making the most of this sanguinary task were the foremost, or spirit mediums, who arrived at the Moonlight Cottage. Over a hundred of them camped out on the ground and erected their altars in the garden. They peered into their crystal balls, or tea bread, or astrological tables. And of course, many of them found the image of Jim Thompson gazing back at them. They kept many of the searchers busy checking one site after another, but they never found the slightest bit of tangible proof. The witch doctors finally went home, their tails between their legs. Perhaps the most famous of this crop of clairvoyants was Peter Hercoe, a deaf mystic who managed to run his pockets before he began to seriously ruminate. Jim Thompson's sister picked up the bill to send her coast to Bangkok, then on to the Camel Highlands. Her coast moved and sniffed around the moonlight cottage, and he ceremoniously seated himself on a veranda in the chair once occupied by Jim Thompson's court. After a few moments of apparently intense concentration, with dramatic stutters and stumbles, he blurted out that Thompson had been lured onto the road by someone he knew. According to her coast, the two men had walked down the road to a truck. Thirteen others in green uniforms had jumped out. Thompson was overpowered, then knocked out. He was thrown into the back of the truck and driven to an airport. Her coast claimed that he could find Thompson, who was still alive. But at that point, the money from Thompson pushed his feet, and her coast gave up the search. Most of Thompson's family took another view of his disappearance. His niece, for example. I was in love with the house. Now they said you could get somebody killed on the back streets of Bangkok for 25 hours. Um, my uncle was very well known around the world. One of the things they had in Iceland was a poor man. And they were saying he was out of the country. And I'm sure he was killed in the world. And this, I said this to the group, and he said to me, why did nobody collect the reward? And I said, oh, they were afraid of the man in Ireland. And I know they were afraid of this man. I mean, that's just too amazing. Henry Thompson, Jim's nephew, and the only one of the family who had actually gone to Bangkok for a visit, also thought that his uncle had not become lost in the jungle. Henry spoke with many people about his uncle's disappearance. Among them was one of his uncle's closest friends, Connie Manscow. She told him about an incident that happened many years later. He was flying from Singapore to uh, Bangkok, and the Chinese gentleman, businessman sitting next door, had said that he had come down from the Cameron Highlands. And she said, I had a friend of mine called Jim Thompson who disappeared up there. And this businessman said, uh, Yes, one of my drivers ran him over. He said, well, why didn't you go to the police? And he said, I couldn't. That was the effect that Jim had uh, disappeared. I could see 
the rationale for everything that's going to the school simulation. Chinese construction company. Makes sense. And there's more, much more, more conspiracy theories, more spy tales, more stories of intrigue, jealousy, or even suicide. All of these many theories and many conspiracy theories that have been advanced um, have no factual basis uh, to provide truth. So, as I say, both the foundation and myself um, feel very strongly that uh, his disappearance was a mystery and remains a mystery today. You is someone that I grew up with. He was someone that was a part of my family, not just my father's friend. And I call him Uncle Jim all my life. When he came to our house, he didn't have to make any announcement. He didn't have to make a special preparation for him. He just come, he opened the fridge, and he opened whatever he likes to drink and do whatever he likes. He might ask you for ice or Hope or something, which I don't think he did anyway, but even though he lived in this art house by the river, it's just wonderful. That's what he liked. I love it. He, he had his shop just one block away from my father's office. I love to be there for lunch and to this June. Good thing. It's a good thing for me. Yeah. Because he didn't die at natural cost. He disappeared. In 1967, Jim Thompson received an invitation to visit Peggy Bunyan, a former Thai Prime Minister in exile in China. During the war, Peggy was an OSS agent fighting the Japanese. But after the war, he was ousted by a coup d'etat and fled to China. Fortunately, Billy Bird a teenager at the time, was privy to the exchange. His father, also a member of the OSS, had been invited first. The elder bird declined. Jim Thompson agreed to go to China and meet his friend and former comrade in arms. My father thought that Greedy was very foolish to have asked for Jim to go and meet with him. And this would really upset the relationship between America, Thailand, and China, which has a very wide implication. Fifty years ago, forty-five years ago, forty years ago, when you talk about the bamboo curtain, you're talking about something that is very fearful. You're talking about taking over a dominating country in Southeast Asia. Jim believes that Freedy is a friend of the OSS. Freedy is a friend of the United States. When a friend calls for something, you run. You don't question. Because those are normally our agreement, which is the paternal among friends. But to turn that into a high political event, I don't believe the Chinese can accept that. That's why Jim went wrong, because he didn't think of the implication of what may come. My father thought that Jim going to the Canada was to arrange for the trip, not to go to China on that trip, because he was not prepared to travel. Jim did not take his pill box with him. Jim did not take his cigarette or cigarette lighter or other personal belongings, which is not something that would be done. For sure, we believe that the Communist Party of Malaya at that time came to meet with Jim. Jim had the appointment with him. That's why he went there. And that's why he was so nervous throughout the trip. He didn't sleep at night. He was thinking about what or what process he would make or how he would talk to me. But 
us from how this thing turned out. Absolutely, he was just kidnapped right from the spot because of all the events that lead up to that time. Point to it that yes, he had the, the meeting with him, but they had other ideas. My father came to the understanding of what took place, and he was convinced that the Chinese came and took him, perhaps, to see baby in China via Cambodia. This was his word. This was exactly his word. My father believed that Kim was picked up by the Chinese communists in Malaysia, or Malaya at that time, and was taken by boat to Cambodia, because that was the only viable method of transport without being seen. The thing that I have told you today is to the best of my recollection and to the truth, and uh, I don't want to make this thing out of proportion. This is my truth. I think my soul will be much more peaceful. So when does that leave us? Now, we know that Jim Thompson went to the Cayman Highlands to meet the Communist Party of Malaya in the hopes of arranging a trip to China. But we also know from many reputable historical sources that the Communist Party of Malaya was fragmented, split into many isolated regional groups. There was very little central control and limited communication with China. Decisions were made locally by necessity. Would one of these regional groups have had direct contact with the Chinese Communist Party? No. Very unlikely. Drawn by the bonds of friendship to Pretty, who was exiled in China, Jim Thompson went to the Cayman Highlands. What follows is about as close as we can come to a first-hand report of what actually happened. Many years ago, Hale Ping, a Singaporean businessman, asked his uncle, who had spent 30 years in the upper echelons of the Malayan Communist Party, about the story that Jim Thompson had been eaten by a tiger. The uncle replied, if you had been eaten by a tiger, that would be gold. But I can tell you, there are no gold to be found. Curious, Tim Ping pursued the matter, and his uncle was quite forthright, speaking candidly and at length, as he sketched out the fate of the silk king of Thailand. Jim Thompson, turn out one day at a bungalow in and then he looked out that he wants to meet Kim Pei. Kim Pei was the leader of the Malayan Communist Party. In fact, at that time, he was a foreign secretary general. During the Second World War, he fought the Japanese alongside the British. In fact, after the war, he was even honored by the British in the old days. But somehow, the British and he had to go on the run because he was fighting for the independence of the land as he was That makes him uh, the most wanted man during that period of the emergency. And Kim Kim is not a person that is so easily accessible according to my book. In his words, I can still remember uh, the bungalow, the gardener, the newspaper man, the vegetable seller, yeah, you know, even the goalkeeper, we are all our people. That's what I mean by our people. The party people. You know? Apparently, that was a, a nest for all the sympathizers there. During that time, we must uh, be aware that the Communist Party is very worthy of the people. Yeah? Uh, lost by a lot of people. And it looks like a lot of people have lost on both sides. I believe he said he, he waited in the 
Tinkering was not even communicated about Jim Thompson's <laughs> desire to see him. Because Tinkering is a man, right? A thought is, you don't probably do little things unless it's very, <laughs> from what I understand, you know, something very substantial that can be achieved. Well, according to the Manager, the Malayan Communist Party did a little bit in Cameroon. Now we don't know what happened to Tim Thompson. We don't know who the executioner was, what weapon he used, and where they buried his body. But it is no longer the mystery that was kept secret for the last 50 years. Tim Thompson died in the mountains of Cameron Highland 50 years ago executed by the members of the Communist Party of Malaya. Have any questions? Right, um, Barry, can you just quickly reintroduce everybody? All right, okay. if we settle down now, please. Okay, we're here to uh, answer questions if we can. Teo Pin, whose uncle mm -hmm. was a senior member of the Malayan Communist Party, is here. The man who I credit with solving the mystery, Swita Hiranpruk, is here. And Willis Bird Jr., whose dad was an OSS colonel and very close friend of Jim Thompson, is with us tonight. So, any questions? Right, it's the usual protocol. There's a, a microphone in the middle of the room. If you want to ask a question, come forward, identify yourself.
And I'm curious to know why nowhere in the film do you mention with whom uh, uh, Jim Thompson went to the Cameron Highlands with? Well, and I think there's a reference to uh, his companion. His companion was Connie Mansgau. Uh, he had several companions with him. Dr. Uh, Amundsen was there. And so was General Ed Black. No, uh, no, I don't think General no, Black, was, Black there. was there. No, yeah. Black, was, Black there. was General Black, Brigadier General Ed Black, U.S. Army, was a just mag commander in Thailand at that time. And Ed Black had recruited Jim Thompson into OSS in 1942. Black was heavily involved in the search, but he wasn't part of the group in the Cameron Highlands when he disappeared. There was this doctor, Dr. 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 Ling. Dr. Ling. Well, the, the uh, host was Dr. Ling, a Singaporean doctor with an American wife. And Jim uh, was a, I won't say regular, but he frequently visited uh, Moonlight Cottage. Connie Mangsgau, uh, a Thai Norwegian woman, was a uh, uh, antique dealer, one of, uh, one of Jim's good friends. She was with him, but she wasn't um, in involved in any way with the disappearance, as far as we know. Right, questions? Hmm. All right, since nobody's asking one, um, why has it taken such a long time for this information to come out? I mean, I, others may know about uh, the pretty invitation. I, I was unaware of that. But why, why has this information suddenly surfaced now? Well, Noy came up with the lead from Teo Pin about four years ago. Yeah. We didn't want to do anything until we had more information. About six months ago, Billy and, and Noy were chatting about this, and, uh, and Billy, why don't you tell us why you didn't mention this before, Billy? <laughs> Nobody asked. <laughs> Well, I can say something about this. In fact, uh, after hearing from my uncle, I have mentioned this in bits and pieces to various people who were interested in their era. Right? And uh, it so happened that Suicha, I'm, I'm stationed in Shanghai, <coughs> was in Shanghai one, one day, and we had dinner, and we were discussing about general things we, we talk about all kinds of things. And I was then referring to, hey, have you heard about this Jim Thompson disappearance? Said, yeah, what do you know about it? And that's where I narrated, and that was about five years ago yeah. that uh, I shared this information with him. And honestly, I did not expect it to come to this <laughs> stage. It was just a personal sharing of what I knew with an old friend. Tiopin and I, I, I know Tiopin for a long time, for, for many, many years, for a dec over a decade, because uh, Tiopin is a closest friend of uh, my also very close friend, the Singaporean uh, chief of intelligence resident here, and very well known a man by the name of Lim Hang Hing. And many of you would have heard about him. Uh, he died a uh, couple of years ago. And one day I was in, in Shanghai with, with Tio Pin and he mentioned this. So I know that um, Barry was, was working with the, the Thompson Foundation, so I called him and said, would that make any sense? And, uh, and when, when, when also Barry comes several times to, to Thailand a year, so one time we met and we talked about this. And you know, he kept it for a while. And until six months ago, I uh, yeah, six, seven months ago, I went up to Chiang Mai. Uh, Billy and I knew each other when we were young. We grew up together. Billy is the, the life member of this uh, FCCT also. But he escaped the traffic to Chiang Mai a long time ago. And live in heaven. So um, one day I, I visited him and I asked him, uh, you know, I, I, this is, um, we talk about Jim Thompson again, which we, we never did. We, we talk about other things. But we, we grew up, I knew Jim Thompson, I knew Connie Munskow. After 
uh, Jim disappeared. Connie Manska was almost daily at my house because uh, Connie and my father was very close. So therefore, we, we, we just took it for granted and we never thought about it. I, I went to the United States in 1967 for a year. I never, you know, I, so I missed all this hoo-ha and read about it in newspapers, that's all. So when I, I hear again about, you know, with this with Billy, and, and Billy and I have, have uh, been in, in uh, security before, and Billy has been in, in, in the very, very high uh, security in this region, and, and we, we are all men, so we don't, we don't, we don't talk about these things. One day I just mentioned to him that, hey, I hear from this Singaporean. And Billy said, whoa. You know, so, let, so we talk about it. And, and I said, would you be willing to do something about it? And he said that, no, they die with us. And I said, no, they don't die with you. So I called Barry. <laughs> and I said, would you like to meet Barry? And so Barry flew, come into town, and he flew up to see Billy. And he said, we got a film. And he said, OK. So we got a film. That's what, what, what we concluded. Now, I would also uh, stress that we don't claim that this is absolutely conclusive because we don't know who gave the order. We don't know how Jim was killed, and we don't know where the body is. Nor do we know why Pre-D wanted to invite Willis Bird Sr., and after he said he wouldn't go, he invited Jim, and, uh, and Billy told me that he thought um, uh, his father told him that uh, Jim would go because Jim had this close relationship with Pre-D. Is that right, Billy? Yes. Pre-D is a kind of man that always like to explain himself what his next steps are, what he's going to do. And as many of you know that <clears throat> a few years before that, he uh, had a big shenanigan in Bangkok by uh, what we call was the, the palace uh, resurrection, or what do you call the, it? The that, that palace coup. Yes. Um, it's not a coup because it did, you know, really uh, went over, but Breedy is a kind of man that is flamboyant, and uh, he's the kind of guy that believed that everybody would have to understand why he's taking a certain action. And uh, he thought that the best man to tell the story to was my father because there were comrades during the uh, Second World War. They worked very closely together and uh, we know the family very well after the war. And uh, they, are, they are what you would have to call a more than buddies because they were comrades in arm. So uh, when Brady asked my father to go and visit him, my father had to take into a very a big consideration of the implication that could really harm, that, that was 1967. 1967, you have a lot of pictures in here about 1967 and 1968. That's a time that you don't even say the word communist. It was really uh, something that was, oh, you, you, you can't talk that word. Or uh, if I sat next to him <laughs> in 1967, <laughs> I would have become a vegetable. That would have, you know, wait make a minute, me uh, Wait a minute, wait a minute. Teo Pin's family were Kuomintang supporters. It was the uncle yeah. went to the bush for 30 years no one knew where he was, what he was doing. Say a, a few words about that. He, uh, you must understand the situation in Singapore, then a British colony. Uh, there were a lot of uh, idealists who wanted Singapore to be independent. And uh, to the Chinese, citizens, uh, to the Chinese that were resident in Singapore then, uh, they were not a recognized lot before independence, okay? Now, what happened is, during those days, they, uh, I think 1937 was when Japan started 
invading China. So the Chinese in Southeast Asia, especially Malaya and Singapore, they were up in arms, not literally in terms of militarily, they to support the Chinese government in terms of donations. So, in fact, my parents, my uncles, they were raising uh, funds to be sent back to China to help the fight against Japan. My uncle fit into that category of very anti-Japanese and very Chinese nationalistic. Okay, so uh, he sympathized. In Singapore, there are two camps. Either you side with the Communist Party or the Kuomintang. During that era, there were these two Chinese that were still vying for their, for their position in, uh, for China. So my uncle, uh, of course, I have aunties who are also in the com uh, uh, supporting the Kuomintang. But this uncle of mine was supporting the uh, belief that the future of China lies with, lay with uh, uh, Mao. Now, after the war, if you, if you do know a bit of that history in Singapore, it was shown just now, Chimping was honored by the British with an even an OBE. But Order of the British Empire. Yeah, Order of the British Empire. A year after that, the British turned against the party. They felt that they were uh, not supportive and n not good for, for Singapore in that sense. And, every, and everybody that was identified then went into hiding. 1950, I can recall uh, from my cousins, one day he just disappeared from the house, from his family, without even telling the, the family he had, he had five children and one unborn kid at that time. And he just disappeared. And two days later, according to my parents, he published in the newspaper that he's now divorced from his wife. He doesn't want to be implicated. You know? And that was 1950. Never heard from him until he surfaced in 1989 after the uh, signing of the peace agreement. Yeah, the between, surrender, actually. Uh, surrender, surrender between of the Communist, uh, uh, Party. Communist Party of Malaya uh, with Thailand and Malaya. That he surfaced one day in my house and he spent two nights in my house and that's where I asked him, amongst many questions, the the you know the this story of uh, Jim Thompson. Oh, by the way, uh, let me let me explain a little bit about uh, Mr. Teopin here. Teopin is not a businessman. Uh, he has been always a very senior uh, uh, civil engineer um, of the public work department in in Singapore and a very highly decorated engineer, you know, and uh, he, he wouldn't tell that, but he uh, has the equivalent of OBE in Singaporean. And um, after his retirement, he was invited to be a counselor of a, uh, a Malaysian uh, company uh, in Shanghai, where he has been ever since on public, uh, you know, because it's a uh, development company. It's a real estate company. Just a minor correction since it's public. I'm not an engineer. I'm actually a surveyor. A surveyor. Uh, a surveyor. Quantity surveyor, yeah. if you know what that is. Yeah. Did I see another question back yeah. there? On you go. Okay. It, it would be good if you queued, because yeah. then we can see you, and it takes. A, uh, there was somebody else, but he walked away. Yeah, <laughs> he's disappeared. No, he's right yeah. behind you. He's disappeared. Yeah. Yeah. Eaten by a lion. Uh, Paul Risley, with the club. Um, this is a great story, and I'm really, I'm really happy that you brought it to all of our attention. But I do have some questions. Josh Kurlansen, a nice Washington fellow, wrote a nice book about Jim Thompson just a few short years ago. And I think he talked to you, Mr. Bird. Why didn't you mention? 
in any of this. This book is great, but the last chapter just ends. So it's not a very satisfying read. So the question is to you, why didn't you tell him this? You say nobody asked you. I'm sure he would have asked you this question. And then a second question, about this Colonel Lim of Singapore. He would have known the facts of this. And he was very active here up until five years ago. Oh, Lim? Yes, no, he doesn't. I, I, I know him. I was his, at his deathbed. He was one of my best friends. Yeah, right. Okay, we'll talk about it. Yeah, let's do it. Yeah, one at a time. What about Josh? What can I you tell you about Josh? Because uh, I don't have a recollection of giving him interview. Sorry. Yeah. I'm sorry, I do not have a recollection. Perhaps I have a lapse in memory or something. <laughs> now, I, when I talked to Billy about this yeah. some time ago in Chiang Mai, and the, the Josh was talking about Jim Jim. And Josh has this theory. He tried to um, uh, equate uh, Jim Thompson uh, and the US foreign policy in Southeast Asia at that time. Jim was against it. He never asked Billy about the disappearance. And so that's why if he'd asked, Billy told me, he would have answered him. But Josh never asked. No, that wasn't part of his agenda, the disappearance. Yeah. Any other questions? Sorry, but you do remember meeting him. Uh, you do remember meeting Joshua. Very vaguely, because I really cannot recollect that I have had a proper interview with Josh. And when I read some of the things in the book, I was quite uh, surprised. I don't want to uh, blame anyone. Perhaps it's my own. But you don't have a clear recollection of speaking to him. Is that what you're saying? I do not have a clear recollection at all okay. of giving him interviews. Proper interviews. Proper interviews. Maybe I sit bump into me or something. But All right, next question. Yeah. No, no, no. Uh, can I uh, address the, the, on, on the Lim? Okay, Lim is a very close friend of mine. I've never shared this with him. Oh, so if you are saying he should have known, then he must have, he, he could, he must have found it from other sources, but I never shared it with him. And I only shared it with Suicha five years ago. Okay. Right? He, uh, Ethiopian kept it to himself because it's not so fashionable. Because, uh, because of uh, the sensitive uh, seat that he, he has here, especially in Thailand, and some of the things, in fact, there are still a lot of things which I never share with him, and I, I still do not share with him. <laughs> Until I get very old. <laughs> so you can have a chat afterwards. Okay, next. Yes, please. Say again. Philip Show or Sunday yeah, Times. Sunday yeah. Times. Yeah, it is. Um, I, I'm so confused by so many things about this film that I'm sort of struggling to come up with a question. Um, it seems that we heard from Jim Thompson's um, nephew who believed that he was uh, hit and killed in a hit and run. And we heard from Jim Thompson's niece who believed he was murdered by some ties because he was a successful silk baron. And we heard from... Um, the CIA station chief's wife, who thought he fell into an animal pit. Um, and then we heard from you, two sources. But just to keep it simple, I will just ask about the two sources for the film. Because you don't have the same story, and yet you're telling us you've solved it. Mr. Bird says that his father thought, supposed, that Jim Thompson was somehow spirited by boat to Cambodia. And uh, our friend from Singapore, says that his uncle told him on his deathbed that he was murdered by the Malayan communists. So if I could just focus amongst this whole morass of confusing claims and suppositions and, and theories on the two people present, why are you saying you've solved the mystery when they've got very different stories? Well, what I would say is that um, I first talked to Teo Pin. He told me his uncle's story where he admitted the Malayan Communist Party killed Jim. And then the question was, why was Jim asking about Chin Peng? Why on earth would he go down to Malaya 
Malaysia and talk about the most wanted man in the country. Then along comes Billy and his father's story about the invitation to go to China to meet with uh, Priti Panamyong. And so suddenly we now know why he was asking about uh, about Jinping, the leader of the communists, to help get him to China or wherever he would meet with Pre D. I mean, the, 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 we don't have all of the um, the pieces of the puzzle, but I think that these two triangulate quite well. Right. Questions. All right. Whilst okay, quickly in the rear. Jonathan Miller from Channel 4 News. Um, just to follow up on that last question, could you tell me, I mean, it's, it strikes me that um, for, a, for a man who has spent his entire career um, in various forms of intelligence and have been a very successful businessman, it would strike me as a very, very stupid thing to do, to go to the Cameron Highlands in Malaysia to start asking around about Malaysia's the most wanted man. The communists, the uh, CPM, had, a, had, a, had their base at the Beton inside Thailand, or on the border, and could be accessed from the Thai side, as we've seen from the, from the collection of tunnels and what are now the peace villages down there. I don't understand why you think that um, Jim Thompson would have taken this risk to go to the Cameron Highlands, which, which actually was never really very central in, uh, in terms of uh, the insurgency in, in, in Malaya. There was a bit of activity in the 1970s and from 73, but that was like six years after Jim Thompson died. So I, I just, if you could explain why you think he would have done something which yeah. was a bit of a sort of schoolboy error um, in terms of, uh, a, as an intelligence operator. Thank you. Well, I'll answer, but not as an intelligence operative. <laughs> okay. Now, uh, chronologically, you are slightly off. Betong only came in, in in the later years. 66, 67, 68, Cameron was, I mean, uh, Highlands was the nest, was the hub of, of uh, communist activity. Jinping only re retreated to Betong when things got hot in Peninsular Malaya and the Thais gave them sanctuary with peace villages and all that. Uh, so, uh, and, uh, so which I probably can fill me in, when, when did uh, Betong Yeah, became under the Hatyai Agreement in 1989, actually, because we've already the Thai, I, I, I was advising the Supreme Command at the time and because I also work as the as the um, volunteer uh, to Supreme Command and National Security Council, and at that time too, uh, we the government has uh, asked General Chavalet to to manage this, and it is it was General Chavalet program to uh, to embrace and take the uh, the CPM into Thailand in order to stop the activities there. Uh, very similar to what we have accommodated, uh, the KMT in 1949, 1950, uh, in Chiang Rai, Chiang Mai, Mae Hong Son. It's the same principle that we did as, uh, as the counter uh, buffer. And so we 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 uh, we had uh, initiated the uh, the more or less the surrender. The everybody knew very well it was the not a ceasefire, not an agreement. The Thai agreed to give two thousand five hundred uh, nationality slots to the uh, Communist Party member mm -hmm. uh, and provide the Chula Pon, the, the the young princess uh, was given the name for the five uh, main lines starting from Betong all the way to almost uh, the east part of the peninsula 
with the Malaysian bordering. So that, that was just after 89. Just to add, before 89, you are talk, when you are referring to 67 to the 70s, the CPM was very active in different pockets in Peninsular Malaya. One of them, the hot, hottest bed was Cameron Highlands. In fact, they even have one in Johor and Perak. Okay? And, and Chin Peng, you, you, you can refer to his book, uh, My Side of History. He retreated back, he treat, retreated to Southern Thailand when things were getting very rough because they were setting up this, what do you call it, settlements to exclude the CPM members from being assisted by the local villagers in terms of food supply. So they kept on retreating and they congregated in Southern Thailand. And apparently the Thais gave them sanctuary for some reason, which is another story <laughs> to be told. Okay? And that's where Beton came into being. I, I would say Beton came into being in the 80s. Yeah, late 80s, 90s. 90s uh, yeah. uh, 89, 89. Not talking about the, the, the surrender agreement. Yeah, right. Uh, in the 60s, they were not there. In fact, they were, uh, when they retreated b into southern Thailand, the British dare not go in. Yes. That's another story to be told. Yeah. Uh, mm. uh, let me make a quick comment on that question. It was a good question. Jim should have known better the risk he was taking to say something so sensitive at that time in that place about the most wanted man in Malaya. But I think, and, and Billy might back me up, Jim had a very close relationship with Pre-D. Jim was, I believe, chief of OSS right at the very end when he came in. And uh, Pre-D was prime minister, later forced out. But he was willing to take a chance to see his old friend. Now. I really want to know why Pretty wanted to see him. I think Pretty wanted to get out of China. This is 67. Pretty went to Paris. He was allowed out in 1970. I, I met Pretty in Paris in 81 and 82. And uh, that's where he died, in exile. But uh, Jim absolutely uh, took a, a big chance and it probably cost him his life. Any other questions? Mike Spencer, I'm a freelance writer. Just one question for perhaps to your pin. Um, would the Malaysian Communist Party in, at that time be wearing uniforms? Okay. In fact, I just went to Betong in October yeah. and visited various camps and their museums. It was a very interesting trip. I spent about a week there. Uh, talking to surviving members there. In fact, if I can reveal, there were two or three of them coming up from Betong tomorrow to meet me. Uh, I intend to follow up on some stories with them. Now, yes, they were wearing uh, uniforms because I saw the photographs in the museums as well as this lady whom I'm going to meet on Friday. Now what is interesting, in case you may not know, CPM in the later years split up into three factions. Very few people know. I only found it out when I was there. They kept it to themselves. And, and because I divulged that I have an uncle that is that was part of their organization, then they were prepared to reveal quite a lot of things. Three factions. Huh? And in the later years, before the surrender agreement of uh, 88, they were killing themselves as well for ideological differences. But that's a different story. Mm. Anyway, the, the reason I ask is about five years ago, I wrote a travel story about the Cameron Highlands, like on the trail of Jim Thompson, I think it was called. 
and I went with a local guide. His name's Mani. He's an Indian chap, and he takes walks through the forests and up to Moonlight Cottage, and obviously talks a lot about Jim Thompson and his disappearance. So I went on that walk, and he said that, uh, because he's from there, he mm. was born there, he said the aunt of his friend was a young girl at the time, and she was cutting bananas at that loop just down below Moonlight Cottage. She recognized Jim Thompson because he was a frequent visitor and he was a well-known character around there. And she said that she saw him get into a car with men in uniform, but she didn't recognize the uniform. And that was his sort of bit of information, so mm. might be worth <laughs> following up because mm. kind of links in with what you're saying. Mm. If they were wearing uniforms. Yeah, they were wearing uniforms. What color uniforms? <laughs> 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 you can ask her. I think she's still alive. Green. Money. Green. Oh, that's Green. Good. I heard no, that story. This is this is I back good. you up, yeah. Yeah. Well not me, it's Green uh, fatigue. Money uh, your story. Yeah, yeah. Now, you should know that uh, the Moonlight Cottage is now called the Jim Thompson Cottage, and it's for rent. <laughs> <laughs> Part of our film crew spent a night there. Yeah. Whilst um, the next uh, questioner comes to the microphone, I'm very intrigued by this invitation. Um, how did it arrive uh, in Bangkok? How, how did this invitation to Jim Thompson and your father appear, Willis? Uh, how, how the invitation was arrived <coughs> yeah, from PD. From PD. The message, yeah. We have our source, yeah? <laughs> but uh, we don't talk much about where we get it. But I didn't want to get into this all the way from right from the beginning, is that if you are aware at all that Breedy did not spend all his time in China, mm. are you aware? Especially in 1967, Six, yeah. 1968, 1969. He spent very little time in China. Right. So. Uh, so he would have been where? Cambodia. Oh, right. From okay, there. That makes a lot more sense, right? Yeah. The uh, the Chinese communists had very uh, high influence in the situation in Cambodia, as you know, up at that time and up until now. It's the same situation in Malaysia. Jim Thompson was a very high profile gentleman. It's very difficult for him to cross the border into uh, Cambodia at that time, even if he knew his final destination <coughs> would be Cambodia. The most logical aspect of traveling would be from Malaysia. So that, for, for us, that would be the most logical and uh, we believe that's why he went to Malaysia on the uh, advice from the uh, Shai Kong in Cambodia. Right. Because the people would be coming from Cambodia, and we have so many people coming across the border. And uh, as you know, in Malaysia, if I may say so, I don't know much about what happened in Malaysia, but from what I know, it's not just a question of being Communist Party Malaysia or Malaya. Actually, it was just being a Chinese was a very difficult uh, uh, period for any Chinese to, uh, to live in Malaya at that time. So that's why so many people had joined because they had no other option. Mm. And yet there were so many factions. It's because they were under stress. So anyone that is Chinese, including him, they looked at him like, oh, he must be an enemy because it's up until what, a couple of years ago, it's still the same thing. It is, it's not. But it, it goes back to Barry's question about what would Pretty want to talk to Jim Thompson about? And uh, uh, I have said it many times that uh, Pretty was the kind of man that always wished to explain his action because he believed that he is very important and very <laughs> vital for the security of that area since he would like to move from China theater over to Paris, he would like to explain why 
he wanted to move. I mean, if that theory floated. Not theory, that is fact. All right, but from, the, yeah. the, if you go back to the 1980s and talk about Priddy, there was always this rumor floating around that he'd written his memoirs, that he had explained what happened, the, the hidden diary, Priddy's account of how he was uh, discredited after the death of the last king, of the last but one king. Um, and so everybody is sort of waiting for him to die so that this book appears to do what you have just said he wanted to do. It never appeared. There is no pretty account of it's missing. It's a missing link. So, uh, you know, I'm not saying you're, you're wrong. I'm just saying it's, it's something we've all been yeah. waiting for that never happened. May I add something? You know, Pretty was uh, uh, the graduate of Sorbonne. He's a French. Uh, the, the revolutionaries in 1932 and uh, 1932 was where all uh, French led. And uh, King Sihanouk in 1960s were not very friendly with Thailand, if you would remember some of the people who were my age or uh, older than me, which I don't see much here. But, but, but uh, Sihanouk was entertaining China uh, openly to annoy the Americans. And he uh, uh, openly uh, embraced Pridi somehow, quietly, who came in from Beijing um, just to annoy Thailand, as, as always, until he ran. He came here first, and we embraced him too, as always, until his death. It's just been like this. It's the love-hate relationship, as always. You know, so, so that's the sensitivity that has been going on between Khmer and Thailand, Cambodia and Thailand, since the their independence. So that's just to add to, to Billy's uh, uh, scenario here. And uh, just to add about my friend, my old friend here, why didn't he go advertising, oh, this, that, about Jim Thompson. Is, if you were him or his father, and they discuss about, okay, I don't want to go, you go. You know, if you want to go, you go. And then he went <laughs> and he disappeared. Would you go in advertising uh, about that too? And Mr. Bird, um, if you were here uh, growing up with me in this town about his father, Mr. Bird was the man. Um, they wrote the story about Ugly American. If you read Ugly American, it is about Mr. Bird, not about the ambassador. So we all knew this. We grew up with this family. You know, we grew up since kids together. We were born the same year. My father was very close to the American community. You know, I saw, I shook up uh, Mr. Donovan uh, hand when I was four, five, four, three, four years old. You know, attending every year the Christmas party in, in the embassy uh, residence. So we knew the, we, we knew it, Bangkok was, a city of 500,000 people, you know, and, and we, we all gather for um, the brunch sometimes at, at the Oriental Hotel. There's nowhere else to go. And the Erawan, when it was built, that's it. That's two places. It's different than today. Now, so Noy is talking I about uh, Wild Bill Donovan, yeah. the uh, head of OSS and the 1953 U.S. ambassador to Thailand. Right, questions, come on, there's a microphone. Can you nip, well you can ask it here, because it'll save time. I'm very shy. Yeah. <laughs> very shy. She's a very shy lady. I am very shy. This seems like the start of a whole other story, and I'm just wondering if you're still researching, and if you're trying desperately to find friends of Teo Pin's uncle, and connections to, um, find out more information. May I answer that for my, my shy friend here? Uh, actually, Tupin is very motivated by this after, because he still um, want to pursue. So I arranged a trip for him to Betong, and another four hour drive to Yala, which is on the east, to see the Abdullah, the Abdullah uh, in Naratiwat. Um, the, on the east side uh, through a very, very dangerous road. 
you know, we have to clear it with the, a lot of people in before because, because he was very uh, intimidated by the situation, the bombs and everything. So <laughs> I put my daughter there, you know, with him. My daughter was a, was a co-producer of this film too and, and she's not here today, she's in the Philippines. And she, of course, I was in, in America at that time and I had to clear the road uh, way ahead of time. Um, and he, w he met with Abdullah. That's why he's still very motivated. And tomorrow and Friday, Friday, actually four members of the CP, CPM. X. X CPM, yeah, it's all uh, coming up to see him. And we, you know, we're thinking about how to verify, how to identify the remaining members or anybody, but, but these are very close people. And we have no time. I'm a businessman, and, you know, and he's, he lives in Shanghai. And Barry lives in America. Billy lives in Chiang Mai. So we, we're still in the back of our mind, you know, I, I, I still want to know more. I want to know uh, that his uncle is recognized and, and who were there in, in the cell in the Cameron Highland who was, I, I believe that they're still here. I mean, even after 50 years. Um, you know, the, the younger ones would still be here, the children of those and all that. If we try hard enough, but would we want to try hard enough? That's another story. But uh, uh, Tiopin um, is interested on the CPM part of it, you know? The romance, <laughs> the romance of being the underground and the, the overseas Chinese uh, arms uh, it was a very interesting trip to Betong because I met the three factions and they, they were not talking to each other, <laughs> okay? Uh, and they have their own museums that tell their own stories. So if you have the opportunity, of course, they may not be able to, I mean, for a Caucasian, you may not miss that, but because I was like one of the us before because my uh, uncles, huh? they really open up a lot of stories, and I, I could, f I could feel. In fact, I was sharing with uh, Barry. There's a whole lot of other stories to be told. Huh? Uh, the intrigue. I don't know. You've heard of Lighter, the triple agent. Lightech. Light uh, in yeah. Chinese, it's Lighter. The triple agent that was a secretary general of CPM for years before he was discovered is uh, in CP uh, in uh, and his photographs was also in the museum and they said this is the traitor that uh, that uh, betrayed two hundred members of the CPM in Batu caves. They were shot by the Japanese. Okay? And they didn't realize it until much later. And my, I asked my uncle about Lighter when he was one of the questions. He says, we only realize it later after two betrayals. One was in, in Batu Caves, and the other is somewhere in the, another meeting in the Pahang jungle. Then it was traced back to him. And they eliminated him in Bangkok. Is, is, is now public knowledge. At that time, when he told me, I didn't believe it. Chin Ping's book confirmed it later. In yeah, this, this is an incredible story that's never really been properly told because this man, this communist, was a uh, Vietnamese to sent by the Comintern to Singapore on the run from the French before the war. But now it turns out the French had recruited him and when he moved to Singapore, he was turned no, no, over to the No, he went over to Hong Kong first and got recruited by the British. I, I stand corrected. <laughs> so he's a French asset yeah, and British day. asset. The Brits left in 42. He was a Japanese asset. Yes. So he betrayed his own people. Fantastic guy. And then uh, the Brits came back, handled him again. Ultimately, he was discovered, he absconded with all of the Malayan Communist Party money, came to Bangkok, Jinping contacted the Thai Communist Party, they killed him and threw him in the Chapia River. And that's a, that's a good story. Yeah, a very strong story. <laughs>
No wonder Can everybody's confused. Oh no, come on. Arnaud Debus with uh, French Radio. If what you say is true, why do you think uh, Pridi Panoumiang never tell about this story? Sorry. I don't know why we didn't hear from Pridi. Um, when I was posted in Paris in the early 80s, I met him twice, always at the King of Thailand's birthday party in, at the Thai Embassy in Paris. And he was willing to talk to me about, I was interested in World War II. I wish I'd known about the Jim Thompson story then. I could have asked him. He was very forthcoming. But it was always about um, cooperation with the Allies in 44, 45. And we didn't talk about anything after that. And then he died around 83 in Paris. So it's a, it's a good question. Where are his memoirs? I don't know. Mm -hmm. If they exist, if they exist, this is um, this is uh, you know puzzle, uh, bits of the story. I mean, you, well, you, you're, you've you're made saying, some very interesting yeah. suppositions, right? Um, but it needs to be backed up. So, what, what, what are you going to do next? What's your next step? Or is I'm going to wait to see what Chin, what uh, Teo Pin finds out. <laughs> He's no, got the uh, best chance. My story ends where the film ends. I'm only pursuing out of curiosity of what my uncle and you know the the party were, were doing in those times that was not recorded I'm trying I'm trying also to I help him here because uh, I, I try to see I try to get him to feel and to see more about the the romance of the revolution of the of the Chinese overseas you know, I see it on a historical point of view. I think it's very interesting uh, how before they became Singapore or they became, you know, uh, Malaysian and when the Malay stopped uh, the trying to do away and kick him out of the country uh, way up in the 80s, you know, they had a, in 1986, they had a very big, 87, I remember, they had the last ratio uh, the racial uh, uprising against the Chinese and, and in Indonesia subsequent in 62 where 300,000 of them were you know, of both Malay and, 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 and uh, 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 Chinese uh, communists were eliminated you know, so that's, uh, that's just a historical part of it. My summary of Jim Thompson personally is that he's an adventurer but he was at the wrong place at the wrong time. That is Cameron Highlands, 67. It and was I'm not hoping, a time. I'm well, hoping that the information that's coming out now, our little film and uh, further inquiry, there's people out there that probably do know uh, what happened. And so I'm hoping that more people yeah. will come forward. Yeah. All right, there's a bit too much noise at the bar. If you could calm down for just 10 minutes. Question, please. Sure, it's uh, Jeremy Donaldson, uh, no news, just uh, interested party actually. Um, I find this to be uh, an absolutely fascinating story um, and uh, I thank you very much for putting the film together and being here tonight to share it with us. There are a couple of questions I do have though. Um, it seems to me that there is, uh, the, the story hangs on the assumption that uh, Jim Thompson continued to uh, be part of the espionage world, and I don't think that there's anybody who's going to deny that. It seems to me that given the experience that he had, wouldn't he have better contacts than, than those that we're assuming that he had when he got to Cameron Highlands and just kind of floated the idea that he wanted to meet Chen Peng? Um, it, it seems to me uh, it, it begs the question, one, did Cheng Peng even know? And the film kind of suggests that Cheng Peng doesn't even know that Jim mm -hmm. Thompson w was looking for yes. him. Cheng Peng probably knew who Jim Thompson was. And so um, there's the question, why was the message never sent? But the bigger question for me is, why is he dealing, why is he asking the janitors for a meeting with the CEO? Like presumably he had higher level contacts and why weren't those contacts used? Do you have okay, a, a that's a that? good question. That's a good question. Yeah. I would say this. Jim Thompson was a war hero in the OSS, 
he received five Bronze Star medals, all won in the European theater. He left government service, 1946, I think, and uh, he, he did not continue in the uh, espionage game. He became a, a, a textile salesman. And uh, he, he didn't know what was going on. Chin Peng was not in Malaysia when Jim went down there. He was, Chin Peng was already in China. So I think that Jim, at the best, was um, out of the business and um, didn't really know what he was getting into. Hmm. Other questions? Yeah. Keep it short. <laughs> In fact, just to add, the few people that I met in Betong in October, I brought up Jim's name. None of them have heard of him. Uh, and they live in a very secluded you know, environment in Betong, untouched by the, uh, the city life of uh, Bangkok. They still they do agriculture, they, they plant their own uh, food. Yeah? So when I mentioned Jim Thompson, you never heard of Wu Zi, you know? And they're all Chinese educated. These are all, all the Chinese who have fought with Jim Ping, and they have, if I may say so, assumed Thai nationality. Question? Question. Yeah. Yes, uh, I'm addressing uh, Mr. Tao Ping uh, from the memory of your uncle. This period of 1967-68, was the period of the end of the Cultural Revolution in China with Liu Chaoxi and other people, remember? Mm. And if this switch didn't uh, have some influence of the attitude of fear in every other little country's understanding that it was the end of the honeymoon, you know, with the heart, Maoism, helping everybody to start a revolution in Thailand, in Malaysia, in Cambodia, and, and in Indonesia, and so. So I just want to know if uh, Jim Thompson was aware about this situation or not, unconscious that it was really dangerous. He was confronting people who didn't know themselves where they were at that time, politically. Do you understand my question, sir? I can't answer for what Jim Thompson could have understand the situation there. But I can add something which I discovered in my trip to Vietong was that there were two different groups. One of them wanted to continue the revolution and believe what Mao did in China could be applied in Malaya. And another group accepted the fact that Malaya by 67, 68 was now an independent country. It's no more, I mean, the, the original mission fighting the Japanese in the first place, fighting the British is no, is no more in place. So, so that, 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 that was a, uh, the split down there along, I would say, ideological lines that, 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 that was affecting the people in Beton. And Jim huh? Thompson didn't know about it. Sorry? Jim Thompson did know about it or not? I don't know. No. That I can't say. <laughs> that I can't say for him. Sorry. I just, uh, you know, tr trying to get into the the thinking of the at the group of people in that era in that place. Thank you, uh. sir. Um, yes, please. Very quick question. Now that so many years have passed, and they release information, secret information, intelligence information, can we be sure today? that Jim Thompson was working for intelligence then or was not? Can we be sure? There must be in the States, you must be able to get all of information, surely. Do your work in the States. What do they say then? What do they say? I don't know what they say, but what I say is Jim wasn't working for anybody except himself. He didn't like US foreign policy. He, he had a lot of friends chief of station in Bangkok, CIA chief, uh, was an old friend of Jim's, just like Ed Black, old friend, old OSS friend. But to answer your question, no, Jim was out of the game, and he got out in 46. 
and the agency started up in 47. And uh, from all I've heard, and I've asked a lot of people, it didn't work for the government, any government. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So that would be um, uh, 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 an argument that um, he wasn't influential, he wasn't a person worth asking for assistance to, right. to go to the US. Right. And if you think about Cambodia then, they had embassies, the French embassy was there, the American embassy was there. If, uh, if Pretty was in the country and he wanted asylum, he could have walked in. He didn't no, need that's why I want to know May, may why I go Pretty into that? Him. Sorry, uh, yeah, please you, do. You, you have to uh, uh, understand that Jim worked with the Free Thai movement. Yeah. This is the, the core. And uh, Pretty was part of the Free Thai movement. Sure. But the government, no. Most of the people at the high level, no. But the royal family, yes. Jim Thompson was very close to the royal family of Thailand at that time. And that, the connection would be Freedy, royal family of Thailand, and the Free Thai movement. This is one body. So oh. well, you're, you're suggesting it's more likely he wants to come back into Thailand? Sir? Are you suggesting it's more likely he wished to come to Thailand? No, 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 no. I never said that. No, no, I, I didn't said, say that. I said, why he picked up the ball? Hmm. He picked up the ball because he was an ex OSS officer, which are, which, uh, are closely associated with the Free Thai and the Thai royal family. That's what yeah, I said. Yeah. Yeah. Let, let me bring you back to 1945. In my view, as a Thai, you know, we lost the war in this, uh, August, uh, September 15, we were the ally, I mean the whole country, except the two groups. One Americanized group, the other one is a British uh, group of free Thai students, you know, a handful, actually. In 1945, September 15, we had 60,000 British soldiers here in this country because they were near and Lord Mountbatten already sent. Also, we, the French were on the way from Paris. They, they couldn't get here because they were far and they were devastated, the whole country. But um, the British had India intact, so they sent 60,000, if you read very well the history. Uh, Lord Mountbatten was planning very much to occupy Thailand and liberate Thailand. And we had a handful of American uh, OSS officers uh, based, landed here the same time, uh, right after. And the leader of the movement was Mr. Willis Bird Sr. You know, because he was uh, removed from, uh, from China into Kandy. Uh, and from Kandy, he came here. The, dark year of Thailand was between 1945 you know, and 1946. That was a very dark period where, where all the army were stripped of arms and the British were occupying all the uh, military installation in Bangkok. And we had to pay them a very dear price of course, with the pressure from the United States of America, with the report from Colonel Byrd, Colonel Thompson, and all those people. That is a very important period that led to our very close relationship with the Americans. You know, that, that, that and Jim Thompson was here at that time with his father. That's why after they resigned from the, the, the office, many of them, remain here. It's a lot of them. the Bangkok Post. Yeah. OSS. Yes. So that's 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 a different story. That's <laughs> seventy plus years from now, you know, but but that's it. You know, I was born in nineteen forty nine. We were born both the same year. Uh, where Colonel Bird has never left Thailand. After he resigned he he married uh, Billy's mother. Um, and, and, and stayed here uh, from the Suet Sila family. 
towards the uh, the the officer of the OS uh, of the OSS sponsored Thai free Thai movement. You know that's that's the that's the scenario in those days. So you have to understand, uh, and it was his father and the OSS who flew uh, King Rama the Eighth back from uh, with the American aircraft from Lausanne back here to preside over the victory march consisting of 60,000 British soldiers and probably about uh, less than a thousand free Thai, uh, uh, 200 of which came from 316 unit and about another 100 came from the American side and the rest of them were peasants from northeast that were recruited and armed. And that's it. The victory march. If you go through the history book, that is it. And Lord Mountbatten was forced by the American to stand aside. And the King Rama VIII was there. And three months later, he was assassinated. So, yeah, this is the story of Thailand. Well, assassination is one story. There's, there's yeah. many, many theories on that one. I'm not going to let that go through. Um, right, are there any more questions? We've run for nearly two hours. Um, I think we could go chasing our tails all night, actually. Um, Barry, you're here. Just in, in a few minutes, just describe the Foreign Correspondents Club of Thailand as it was in 1962. And, and that comment you made to me about who was the president at the time yeah, at lunch the other day. It didn't look like this. <laughs> in 62, I'm going to say there were a dozen working press. There were no associate members. The official president, we looked, at, looked it up with Prasong. Prasong was um, UPI. But the man that we all looked to and respected and who more or less directed things was um, Kukrit Mamrachwang. Mamrachwang yeah, yeah. Kukrit Pramod, later prime minister. At that time, Kukrit was, uh, I believe, the London Sunday Times correspondent in Bangkok. And we would have very informal meetings, usually at Mizu's Kitchen on Patpong Road. My office, AP office, was 103 Patpong. Uh, UPI was down the street. Reuters wasn't far away. Uh, Mizu's was a, a, a nice little, I think it's still there. It is, it's still, is it still, there. still there. I think Mizu, Mizutani was a deserter from the Japanese army, but uh, the war was over. Uh, so it was, a, it was a, a friendly bunch of a few guys, and uh, I enjoyed it. I was 18 at the time when I joined AP in Bangkok. Good. Well, anyway, um, Barry is writing his memoirs. He's got five chapters to go. And there's, there's a bunch of uh, standalone stories. There's about five stories to go. Yeah. It depends how long I'm around. Right, well, hurry up and finish it. And, uh, <laughs> and we'll, we'll sell it at the club because we're selling uh, books that are written by members. Okay, well, look, that's a very uh, fascinating evening. It, it opens more questions than one can imagine. You know, we can go on forever. Um, and I'd like to thank you all for coming to talk to us. Uh, it